Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's PASS webinar in partnership with DataVail. Uh, we're excited you could join us today for Jeff Duncan's session on Accelerate SQL Server Migration to the AWS Cloud. This session is being recorded and will be posted online after the event. You will receive an email letting you know when the rec recording becomes available. I'm the moderator today. My name is Leslie Weed. I'm the president of the Virtual Performance Group a board member for the Denver SQL Users Group, and a data architect at large in Denver. Um, and very excited to host DataVail today and hear about this. This is really good information. So I have a, just a few introductory slides before I hand this over to Jeff. Um, so we'll go through these slides real quick so we can get right to the, the big picture here. So Jeff, if we could go ahead and move on there. So everybody should know about the Big Pass Summit Conference, hopefully. This is coming up November 10th through the 13th in Houston, Texas. Absolutely fantastic event. Great networking, great learning. Um, Pass Marathon is coming up for the Performance Monitoring Edition in March. Uh, so please uh, register for that. That's going to be a good one. And for those unfamiliar with GoToWebinar, we do suggest that you maximize your screen. Uh, there is a questions pane in the window, so if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, we will either answer them privately or we will respond to them as a whole during the session. Um, also, there's going to be a set evaluation at the end of the session. We really encourage you to fill that out. That really helps us improve these sessions in the future. Um, in addition, there will be polls during this time, so just keep an eye out for those. So a lot of interaction going to be going on for this webinar. And that's the big one. Also, hopefully all of you are PASS.org members. If not, free membership, go out there, take, take control of your career. Lots of stuff on the website, lots of webinars going on. All right, what's up next? The big presentation. We have Jeff Duncan with us. He is a DBA manager at, uh, with DataVail. And um, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself as we go into this because nobody knows you better than yourself, right? <laughs> Are you on mute, Jeff? Are you able to hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Jeff Duncan. Uh, I've dealt with SQL Server for about 22 years now, which means I did survive Y2K with no problems. Um, other than that, I've been, like I said, working with all different versions of SQL Server from SQL 6.5 all the way up through some of the newest and latest versions. Um, and then hopefully I can actually share some items with you today that'll uh, benefit you and your uh, journey to the cloud. We are also having um, uh, a drawing today uh, for um, so a set of nice headphones and everything. And so to be able to participate in that, they're gonna be popping out a link for you guys. Um, click the link when you get an opportunity and then sometime today, you don't have to fill it out during the webinar because we'd like for you to be able to uh, pay attention and learn the information being presented. But uh, to participate in the drawing, fill out the, the form at the end of the link and by the end of the day, and you'll be in a drawing to get a really nice set of headphones and be able to um, use those in the future for your future webinars. Okay. Let's see. All right, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, moving to the cloud and uh, uh, AWS and the cloud options. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, us at DataVail and everything first. So uh, DataVail, it was a SQL Server based business uh, when it started out full of SQL DBAs, but we've been able to grow a lot over the last 15 years and uh, we now also support every version you can think of of the different database systems, uh, migrations to and from, data imports to and from, all those different sources. Uh, and we've got a lot of activity of doing migrations to the cloud. Uh, over seven years just for AWS, but we've done AWS and Azure, uh, hundreds of migrations for all of the above. So if you need help with your cloud journey, uh, I'd like to encourage you to make a call and uh, let us help you out and help you make some of the decisions that you'll need to make uh, 
for a smooth transition uh, for the for your future for your business. All right. So the agenda for today, uh, we got six basic topic points um, talking about the cloud itself. What is it? Uh, who is it? Why should I go to it? Um, digging into the cloud a little bit. Uh, what's the difference between IAAS, SAAS, and PAAS acronyms? There's like any technology-based topic, there's going to be acronyms everywhere, but I promise you I'm going to um, explain and decipher what each one of them actually mean so you don't have to turn around and Google them yourself and figure out what I was talking about. Um, next line of the agenda is actually um, AWS's offerings for those, IAAS and uh, PAAS, is um, um, their EC2 and their RDS. Again, tons of acronyms, I'll explain them, I promise. SQL Server High Availability and Disaster Recovery, uh, some migration methodology, and then finally, if you've taken my databases away and stuck them in the cloud, what's the, the DBA's role in the cloud? What am I supposed to do? All right, with that, we'll get moving forward. So what is the cloud? I remember about 14 years ago, uh, I was a DBA team manager, and my CIO just happened to casually stroll down and he popped in my office and I'm positive he was one of the kind of guys that just finished reading like one of those CIO articles and uh, uh, then he'd walk around and say all kinds of different buzzwords and and uh, common catchphrases to let everybody know how much ahead of the game that he was but he came in my office and was starting to say you know uh, we need to get ready to move our stuff into the cloud. That's the next best thing and all this jazz. And he threw out all the, the acronyms also that I had no clue what they meant. And like any other IT professional that, you know, of course, is supposed to know everything, I nodded and smiled and said all those different things. Sure, yeah, let's, let's look into that. And waited until he left and then just started Googling everything on my own because I had no idea what he was talking about. So uh, we're going to start from that, talking about a little bit what is the cloud. Um, a cloud database is a collection of informational content. It could be either structured or unstructured that resides on a private public or hybrid cloud computing infrastructure platform from a structure and design perspective, a cloud database is actually no different than one that operates on a business's own on-premises servers. Uh, the critical difference actually lies in where the database ends up residing. An on-premises database is accessible to local users at that business, but a cloud database is actually accessible over the internet. But if you have an application that's using that as an in-source, it, it should appear exactly the same. It's just an option to pull data from a different destination, a different location. So an on-premises database usually is accessed over your local LAN. Uh, so that does have a slightly higher, slightly faster response usually than a cloud-based database, which requires a, a round trip internet connection to be able to uh, have a single transaction or to have an interaction with the database. So uh, with that being said and jumping out and throwing out what's, what is the cloud, let me find out a little bit about uh, the people that are on the call today and find out where are you in your poll, uh, in your cloud journey. So we're going to throw out our first poll today uh, and give you guys a chance to actually respond. Where are you today in your cloud journey? So pick one of these guys. Uh, are you not even started? Are you in the beginning stages? Are you in, in the middle? Are you already uh, already there in your, your, your journey and need to actually just get some tips on everything all moving forward from there? So Jeff, I already threw this out. And interestingly, we have 8% already there, 16% not even started, 23% midway and 52% in the beginning stages. So definitely people really starting to go. Excellent. So um, there's always concerns. That's why I guess it seems like a majority of them have uh, might be in the beginning phases and are kind of just trying to test the waters and figuring out uh, what should we do? Do we make the right decisions? Can, can we afford to go there? Can we afford not to go there? And so that's uh, hopefully I'll be able to have some points that'll help you guys make some of those decisions today, or at least give you advice on uh, what you need to do to start moving forward. Okay, 
So the next uh, one is um, who is the cloud? So uh, 14 years ago, this big journey to the cloud is actually what what began back in like 2006. And from the very beginning, AWS has been the majority leader. So they have double the market compared to the number two provider, which right now is Microsoft. Uh, AWS carries 38% of the uh, the cloud market, and uh, um, uh, Microsoft has uh, exactly half that, which is 19%. Now, I will say, look, see, Amazon has been steady for, like I said, the last 14 years, keeping that share of about uh, almost 40% of the market. Microsoft has definitely had a big push over the last four years, and they've doubled the the slice that they've um, are able to capture, but they are taking it away from all of the other groups. So Amazon has been able to, to hold on to and be the leader for the market. Microsoft is growing and they do have a lot of good things that they can offer as well, but they seem to be taking the pie away from uh, the other providers. The the top four, which actually do hit listed on here are definitely Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Alibaba. AWS is actually, uh, like I said, they have, uh, double the market, but they also have double the Windows server instances that uh, in their environment. They have twice as many regions uh, with availability zones offered. And here's one of the big ones that I think matters when you're making your decision also. They have seven times fewer downtime hours in 2018. I don't have numbers yet for 2019, but in 2018, they have seven times less downtime hours. Downtime hours means more uptime for you. So less time their, their networks had to be down, less time their systems had to be down uh, than the other providers. So I think that's a, a, a major thing to also consider. Now, let's see here next. Why should we go to the cloud whatsoever? Uh, is there a reason for your business to do it? Um, the cloud actually can fit your business strategy if you're looking to expand your business and actually become a uh, part of the global market and uh, we want those services to be available for you 24 7 then your business could actually benefit from having a cloud system if you need to be able to support global traffic then you need a robust and reliable infrastructure Building and maintaining this in-house definitely would be very expensive, especially in the startup and testing phase and then going on long term. See, the cloud offers a reliable system that already operates at a global level. By choosing AWS as your cloud provider, companies can build and test the system on a small scale and then scale up to more extensive resources once your product or service is actually launched. So you don't have to have that big giant purchase at one time in the very beginning. You don't have to have established and in place that dev, test, QA, prod, and have all of your uh, hard drive and shared disk spaces in place that our system's gonna be able to grow into over the next two years. You don't have to, to buy all that upfront. You can allocate what you need when you need it. And then as you grow, grow the system with you. So you don't have to have the big purchases up front. So the cloud also will reduce both your capital and operational expenses. And that, that almost sounds like a really, uh, but basically it's a true statement. It's gonna, re it can reduce your costs. So it's less expensive again, that like I just mentioned, than creating your own infrastructure. So just imagine how many servers you'd need and the hours necessary to set up that whole infrastructure and how much time and money would need to be spent on the different security protocols and certificates and networks and switches and things like that. With the cloud, you only pay for the resources that you're using, which will be fewer during your testing period. And then once you get the ball rolling, you can then allocate more assets and pay accordingly. So you don't like, again, you don't have to have it all up front. And the second point, which is one I think is actually really neat, the price of cloud services is actually decreasing. It's on a decline, the price. Uh, and it's especially true with uh, AWS services because as the popularity of cloud systems grow, pricing is reduced and the respond to the massive supply and demand has, has driven those prices down. 
So what's neat, giving that trend, um, you could implement the cloud right now. And then over the next one year or two years, there's a, a high chance that you'll be paying less than you are right now if you've already got it implemented. So only pay for what you're currently using. And there's no need to buy that beefy server that will finally grow into someday in advance. And when you do need the extra room, you can use it. No questions asked and you just uh, expand into it. Now, third is uh, um, uh, the, the cloud provides you a safe and secure system, uh, which means uh, companies that are contemplating and thinking about moving to the cloud, um, security is usually their primary concern. They're always worried that if I give up my data, uh, something's going to happen to it. And they always feel so much better that they have that server in the server room just right around the corner. And they're always worried that their data can't be as secure as it is, like I said, when it's right around the corner and I can go there and put my hand on it. That's definitely uh, a safer feeling for a lot of individuals, but that's truly, it's a misconception. Uh, if you use it like a, a, a castle uh, theology is basically um, when it's inside your castle, you've got your own knights protecting it, but how big is your castle and how many knights do you have to protect it? Um, when you that compare yourself to AWS and all what they have to offer, they have a very large castle and they have uh, hundreds of engineers, hundreds of knights working night and day to make sure everything is safe and sound. So when you compare your resource sources that you would have to protecting your data to the amount of resources that AWS would be able to offer to keep your data protected, it's it's not even really a comparison. So AWS guarantees that the data placed on their servers will be protected. And so if they broke that promise, it means that AWS would risk their entire business uh, and the enormous trust placed in their business by millions of clients from all over the world. So data security is something that AWS and all of the primary cloud providers take very serious. So not just AWS, Azure, of course, they it's a serious topic and they wanna make sure that you can rest assured that your data cannot be any safer than it is right now. So with that being said, okay, let, you know what? Let me finish this one more portion of this here. Uh, the data also will always be yours. So another misconception is that once you give up your data to a cloud company, it no longer belongs to you. It's no longer yours. It's not proprietarily yours, but that's not true. Um, the ownership of your information still will always remain the same, even after the physical location of the data has changed. So in other words, your company still owns the database, even after it's left the building, and AWS guarantees a high level of data protection. So they offer uh, a numerous amount of powerful tools to allow your customers uh, to choose from a variety of storage, access, and security options. And they have millions of active customers in the educational and enterprise and governmental institution, including financial services and healthcare providers in AWS's customer list. So if, if they're able to entrust their data to AWS, I, I can guarantee you that you should be able to entrust your data to AWS also. Now, uh, uh, third thing is only authorized company members will be able to access the data in the cloud, in the database. So as with any data ownership, uh, people are always worried that uh, they won't be able to control who's able to access my data and what's able to happen to it once it's there. Is someone else gonna be able to query and pull out my data? Um, that's very much so locked down and at your discretion. So AWS Cloud ensures that only authorized members of your team will be able to access your data. And since you're the account owner, you'll be able to set separate permissions for every team member and decide who is actually able to access what. So there's no, I gave it up and now someone that I don't know is able to get a hold of my data. That's not the way it is. You are in complete control of everything. 
and uh, the, the last point about the cloud here is um, it, it gives your business the agility to be flexible and move and grow when your business needs to grow. So um, you don't have to uh, buy that big SAN system in advance. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, running out of memory or disk space because as you need things, you can move agilely with it. You can actually flexibly expand, give yourself more memory, give yourself more disk space, add more CPUs, uh, add another node to your availability group. So it gives you that agility to be flexible and dynamically add things as needed instead of having to make sure that your system is set up for growth needs in advance and you have it ready to go two years ahead of time. All right. So uh, now we went through that, talked about why you should go to the cloud. So the next thing is we're gonna talk about the, the next poll. So um, what are the top challenges you're anticipating or have you experienced so far in your journey to the cloud? So this is interesting, Jeff, yeah. Okay. So everybody's putting in their answer right now. Um, and, and, and I always say, you know, with those small and medium sized businesses, especially they just can't afford the best security engineers in the world. Right. Yeah. And, and, and there's so many of them, I think they're at the greatest risk a lot of times. Agreed. Uh, uh, no, I, I think, um, businesses before they go to the cloud, that's their biggest secure, uh, um, biggest concern is the security and the privacy um, businesses, once they're in the cloud and they realize uh, all, all the changes that they've been able to go through and the existing security that is there feel much more confident. So I think those individuals that are just looking into it and just uh, beginning to move forward are going to be a little bit more more. Uh, cautious and afraid uh, that they're not going to have the security that they need. But again, I, I think I already mentioned they have uh, AWS has hundreds of engineers there to provide you with the best security possible when there's no way that your individual business could afford that level of security engineers. So that, that's that's one of the, the huge benefits of going to the cloud and taking advantage of that. It's something you can lean on, but not something that you have to pay. You don't have to pay for those engineers out of your local IT resources. You pay for the servers that you use and the space that you use and the processors that you use. And the rest of that is just added benefit for the service. Your results for the poll are on the screen. We see that systems and application integration came in at the top concern. Um, and then at the bottom is of course other, and then we've got um, leading in second. It's kind of a tie there between security, privacy, and increased costs and complexity. Excellent. Okay, so uh, a little bit later, we'll be talking about um, um, moving your SQL servers and everything to the cloud. and uh, maybe the different decisions you'll have to make on, on on which choices to move and where to go. Uh, do we go to EC2? Do we go to RDS? And which ones might be easier for your migration of your existing systems and applications? So uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you some points that'll help you guys out in your concerns. Alrighty, so uh, here comes the beginning of all of the acronyms again. So I know I mentioned that uh, there's going to be quite a few of them. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to explain them to you as I go also. So uh, when you first start Googling the cloud uh, or, you know, the cloud with relation to SQL Server uh, uh, or systems moving to the cloud, you're going to come up with the different categories of the cloud providers, the services they actually provide. So uh, the first one, of course, you can see is your on-premise. So uh, that's where you are right now. Uh, what do you have to do and uh, uh, your servers and your responsibilities right now? So the, the first thing that the cloud services offer is called IaaS or infrastructure as a service. Uh, the closest way to, to describe this is almost like um, a virtual server but it's actually owned by the, the cloud company. 
um, but you treat it almost just like it's a regular virtual server, like it would be in your own environment. Um, the next section is the platform as a service. That's the, the generic umbrella for that. But uh, uh, for database guys, a lot of times you might hear this one also called database as a service. Um, and then the last one is software as a service. So IaaS is where um, a third party provides highly automated and scalable IT infrastructure. So that's storage, hosting, compute, network working out of its own global data centers and only charges you for what you use. So rather than owning all these different assets or owning your on-premise servers, companies can flexibly rent resources according to their needs. So like I said, it's, it's very similar to um, a virtual server, but the, uh, the company that you're leasing it from is, owns the hardware itself. And so you only have to worry about your image and what goes on inside your image. Um, uh, the next section is the platform as a service. And it's like I said, it's probably the hardest of the three cloud models to define. Um, but the idea is to provide all the basics of IaaS as well as the tools and the capabilities needed to develop and deploy applications, including the middleware, database management, uh, analytics, or even an operating system. Uh, a platform as a service pro uh, should provide a developer with everything they need to build and deploy an application without having to do any provisioning of the underlying infrastructure themselves. So when you choose platform as a service, um, your developer only worries about uh, the database itself. He doesn't have to worry about um, setting up networking, setting up windows, setting up uh, uh, installing the uh, uh, operating system, installing the, the database service itself and any other services. You know, you, you just select your PAAS, select your database type and begin working and deploying and developing in your database environment. And now the last one, software as a service is where a piece of software is hosted by a third party and can be accessed over the web. So normally just by logging in and it's generally charged as a subscription basis per user or per seat. So this differs from the old model of buying and installing software on a machine or a server manually. Uh, SAAS is much more relevant for very specific applications like um, email or a customer relationship management, CRM software, uh, anyone that's actually used uh, web-based Gmail or Google Docs or uh, a cloud file storage like Dropbox or, or even ticketing systems like Jira is basically uh, using a piece of SAAS. So um, uh, the, the generic concept is um, you, uh, might implement something in PAAS, you implement a database, you implement a piece of software in PAAS, and then when you provide that to your customer and they access it through the web to use your tool, now you're actually providing them SAAS, software as a service. So uh, that's from your customer aspect, and I'm sure uh, many of us have actually looked into different CRMs and things like that. That's actually the same thing, software as a service. All right, guys, let's talk a little bit about migration methodology. So the purpose of this slide is to try to get you to think of the entire process. So you need to involve your stakeholders, of course, from the very beginning. Uh, try to evaluate your current cost of ownership, what it will cost you to continue on your current in-house path, and then finally, what is it going to cost you uh, going into the cloud right now and then continue it in the cloud. So sometimes that's hard to come up with, and that's probably why some of you are here today, is to help you make that kind of decisions. And uh, basically you end up having to admit that you may need some help. So the goal is to end up saving you money. And then what happens is you reinvest those savings into your new cloud infrastructure so you can grow more and do more. And finally, uh, you'll never stop thinking about security. Security and data protection and your monitoring is going to be an ongoing thing uh, forever. So always have that in mind, always keep your security in mind and make sure everything's protected. Um, uh, and then it's just like a, a, an ongoing cycle. So 
next I'm going to talk about, uh, we mentioned from um, uh, a cloud perspective, IAAS, SAAS, uh, PAAS. Um, this is actually what Amazon provides for uh, your infrastructure as a service, which will be the EC2 option, or the uh, PAAS, um, which will be the RD, RDS, the Relational Database Service. So um, EC2 stands for Elastic Compute cloud that's a that's one in my brain i keep flipping back and forth i keep wanting to say elastic cloud compute but it's elastic compute cloud and this is the aws version of a virtual machine in the cloud uh the cool thing about it is it's highly scalable and it's achieved by uh simple creating a custom ami that's another acronym so it stands for amazon machine image it's almost like um, when you're talking about virtual server, it's like a snapshot, but it's uh, by creating a custom AMI from an existing EC2 instance and then creating another EC2 instance using this already configured image. Uh, now, if you're deploying this within the exact same domain, there's a little bit of juggling you have to do, but it's actually very simple. It's almost like a copy and paste, and then you've now deployed a duplicate of that exact environment. Uh, you will need to create, uh, uh, scale out your existing one, copy and paste. You need to actually create from your dev environment, go ahead and make your testing and QA environment, use that same functionality, uh, copy and make that custom AMI, deploy it to a new server. So also you have very easy backups. So creating an image of an EC2 is uh, basically like taking a backup of the entire server. And cloud computing now makes this very easy. Using SQL Server in Amazon EC2 instance is very much like having your own SQL Server instance deployed on premises. It's almost exactly the same to you. Access to the OS is allowed. Uh, you can add more storage, configure database file locations as desired. Uh, you can use any features available for the addition of SQL Server you've chosen. And you can also perform native backups to the Amazon S3, which means the simple storage service. That's what S3 stands for, simple storage service. Buckets uh, using uh, like a software called like TNT Drive. So the idea is you can mount that S3 bucket onto your EC2 server, backup, do your backups to that server, but you can also mount that um, S3 bucket on your RDS servers, and you can use that as a method to uh, migrate data back and forth between your EC2s and your RDS, so that S3 bucket can attach to all different types of environments, and you need if you need to share data. Um, let's see here, next slide. Okay, EC2 has a ton of different uh, instant types to choose from. Um, by taking a look at this slide, you can see there's like 30 different choices. Um, when you go away today, if you ever want, you wanted to get an idea of what all is really there, you can actually Google um, EC2 instance types and the very first page that comes up is an Amazon page and it'll have all of these different uh, instance types there for you. You can click through and read them all. We could easily make another two hour session just describing all of the different instance types in EC2. But I, I wanted to make sure I tried to give you something. So I talked to our um, uh, our cloud team at Dataville and uh, they gave me some tips on how I should actually uh, make this a little bit simpler for you. So when you're gonna decide and choose your EC2 instance type, you have to consider three things, uh, your memory, your processor, and your database size, okay? So if you're going to be creating a, a generic or a small SQL server, pick the, the C, T, or M, so they could be in the, the, the general purpose category if it's a T, um, uh, or the M's in general purpose, or even a, the, the compute optimized ones under C, you know, if they need to be, have a little tiny bit more processing. So general purpose or compute for the generic and small ones. Now, 
for the memory optimized ones or the ones that might be like some of your more intensive OLTP servers that need to be able to uh, pull things in memory and have a lot of things saved. And uh, like I said, a lot of memory items, uh, I would aim for an R5. That's what you would try to choose there. Now, a data warehouse is normally configured with a type I. So that's storage optimized all the way on the right side. Um, that's because usually you need a uh, really good throughput uh, for that. You have a lot of data pumping in and a lot of data pumping out for a data warehouse, but it might not be as memory intensive. It's more of uh, data push, data pull, and, 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 and having that to be able to work. So um, you go for maybe the I's, the I3 for storage optimized for your data warehouses. And then now finally, if you have a multi terabyte database system, one of those very, very large database, um, you'd pick an X type. So that's a, another memory optimized, but it's more designed for very, very large database systems. So that, that should give you a little bit of a head start on what type of instances to pick. Again, like I said, you can Google a little bit later. You can actually read the details of each of those, but my advice is to get further advice helping you evaluate what your server is and where it fits, and then in selecting the different instant types. Um, the next thing you'll have to consider also is the actual, oh, there we go, yeah, is the actual disks you're going to be choosing for your EC2 systems. So uh, in a nutshell, there's two different types of disks that you could choose from, SSD or HDD, so solid state or hard disks. And then there's definitely two tiers of options within each disk type. So you have the higher level tier and lower level tier for your SSD, same thing for your HDD. So which do I pick for my server? Um, if you have, uh, like I said, that mission critical OLTP server, um, you would pick the top tier of your SSD. Now, this is very consistent IOPS, but it's also very expensive. So the, you pick that only for the most critical servers that need that crazy horsepower, you know, that you to actually provide what you need. Um, the next level down is where you would put your general purpose uh, SQL servers is in that um, that next level down of the SSDs. So it's definitely it's cheaper than the top tier of uh, uh, SSD, but it still has decent burst IOPS. So if you have a, a regular SQL server that uh, usually goes at a nice steady pace, but every once in a while you need to crank out a little bit of horsepower, then uh, it, but it's not. Um, like I said, that not that critical OLTP server, then you can definitely choose the uh, uh, the cheaper one, the GP2 model of the SSD. Now, uh, thirdly, uh, I know I mentioned those um, uh, data warehouse type servers that have just a ton of data going in and a ton of data going out. They're actually really good to choose the HDD, the uh, the the top tier of that, because they're throughput optimized. You can actually crunch out a lot of data going in and a lot of data going out, and that would be the best choice for you, not the uh, SSDs. So the next thing, we'll talk a little bit about RDS. We've talked a lot about the EC2s. Now, uh, RDS, again, like I mentioned, is their um, uh, database as a service under the umbrella of platform as a service. Uh, generally, RDS actually costs 20% more than a naked EC2 instance. But um, you don't have to worry about setting up the operating system. You don't have to worry about operating system patching. You don't have to worry about database patching, backups, and then uh, your high availability and disaster recovery is also built into it uh, if you set it up for multi availability zones. So it's built into it. You don't have to manage your high availability systems also. It's built into it. Uh, RDS is also optimized for memory, performance, and I.O. So um, generically speaking, if you take the exact same database and put it in a naked EC2 instance and then take that exact same in database and put it in RDS, the RDS database is going to perform faster. Now, that's not a guarantee, but that's if you look it up, you start Googling it and you get some different feedback, 
generally it's at least 20%, sometimes 50% faster. But there are um, um, some drawbacks, uh, I shouldn't say drawbacks, there are some limitations of being able to use RDS as well. So, uh, which brings me up to my next slide. Okay, oh, I think I skipped one, back it up. Okay, so RDS, basically if you need uh, SQL Server analysis services, um, integration services, reporting services, uh, data quality services or master data services, you can't have them installed on the same server as your RDS database that you've deployed. Um, it has to be a separate server. So Amazon recommends that if you need those, that you set that up on an EC2. Um, otherwise, you could also, if you needed just those databases, you could always still have your uh, an on-premises server or, like I said, a, a separate EC2 server that covers these services, but you can still use that RDS database as your data source. So you can still point them to that database you have on RDS, but you can't have those services running on the same server. So those services would need to be implemented on an EC2 server or an on-premises server to be able to use them. Uh, next, we also have uh, the different limitations in RDS. So um, some of the features that we've come to know and come to love also that are inside the newer versions of SQL, uh, RDS, has some limitations and can't actually take advantage of them. Now, I'm not gonna just go through the list here and read each one of them, but stretch database is one that you can't use in RDS. Um, database mail, um, that's kind of one that I think we're all very used to, but the, you can't use that inside RDS. Uh, log shipping, replication, same thing. File stream, if your system needs file stream, um, that's also not an option inside of RDS. Um, and then at the end here, um, create endpoint is unavailable, which means you can't do service broker endpoints, you can't do T-SQL endpoints. But there are, like I said, there's a lot of um, advantages, like I said, in RDS, but there's a, a lot of limitations as well. Uh, another thing, like I said, so you can't have, um, you can't use your distributed transaction coordinator because uh, also you have limitations in using linked servers and distributed queries. So you can, use, can put together a distributed query, or you can actually implement a linked server in RDS, but it's definitely different and definitely has some other restrictions and limitations. And certain there are certain things that you cannot connect as a linked server now that maybe you were used to with EC2 uh, in the past. So definitely, if you're thinking about RDS, it's an awesome thing but you need to make sure that it's not gonna conflict with what you have, uh, with some of the features that you need. Uh, very likely, um, what you'll need to end up doing is probably some type of a lift and shift or get everything over into EC2 and then think about um, uh, migrating or changing things as you go over to RDS. Because it's, it's just definitely not as easy to implement into RDS directly in the beginning. All right, next. We're gonna talk about high availability and disaster recovery. So in your EC2 instance, all native high availability and disaster recovery exist here. So anything that you can do in your local version of SQL Server, uh, clustering, always on, uh, you can do with EC2. So that's, that's awesome. But um, taking that one step further, um, you can use tool, uh, tool that AWS provide that's called SIOS Data Keeper Cluster Edition. And basically that allows you to uh, set up a SANless cluster uh, if you wanted to end up using SQL clustering instead of always on. So uh, you can set up SQL clustering. It can be across uh, another data center, you know, so it doesn't have to be in the exact same region or exact same zone without having a shared SAN disk space. Um, Another feature that AWS offers is the concept of availability zones. So you can think of them like a separate AWS data center for disaster recovery purposes, but you can have your data in both. So clustering is, is set up using FCI, which is failover clustering 
instance, and this is normally always, the rule is usually always, it has to be in the same data center since all the nodes in an FCI cluster must have access to the same shared storage. Um, let me go on to the next slide and we may, explains it maybe a little bit better. There we go. So normally locating these nodes in different data centers could adversely impact performance. However, uh, with AWS, the FCI nodes can be located in separate availability zones and still provide good performance because of the low latency networks that AWS has between all availabilities, availability zones within the same region. The piece that allows this is actually called scale out file server but you can set up auto failover for your server within the same availability zone. And you can even manually fill it over to another availability zone in case of a complete availability zone failure. So um, you can see from the screen right here, you can, if you have it in within the same region, let, let's say in the same area, you're in Florida, um, and then uh, you can actually set up to synchronously be in two different availability zones, but in the same exact region, and it can auto fail over to each other. That's awesome. But um, you wanna actually increase your disaster recovery. You can set up in a completely other region, like let's just say California, and in an availability zone there, you can set up a third node, um, but that node can be asynchronous. And then if something happens to your complete region where your primary systems are, uh, where they automatically fail over to each other, you can make a business decision because that hurricane came through and wiped out Florida. And then you can uh, manually fail over to your California server. And then you only have to worry about San Andreas fault. And then, so now you've got that moved over to the other side of the country and you can move forward and be no problem. Um, Let's talk a little bit about RDS. Um, when you uh, set up RDS for, uh, you can set it up for multi availability zone deployments. And when you provision a, a multi AZ database instance, Amazon RDS will automatically create a primary database instance. And then it synchronously replicates the data to a standby instance in a different availability zone. So it will automatically make, make one the primary, it'll automatically make a secondary in a different zone. And if something happens and it, to that uh, zone and there's an infrastructure type failure, it performs an automatic failover to your standby instance without you having to do any kind of configuring whatsoever. And since the endpoint for your database instance remains the exactly the same, your application doesn't see any difference. There will be just a hiccup because you actually failed over from A to B, but your application will pick up where it left off and resume database operation without you having to have that manual administrative intervention and without you having to do any big configuration in the beginning. So you don't have to change or make your application special to be cluster aware. It basically, it gives it, uh, it has a hiccup. It, burps, it fails over to the other node, and then your application can continue on. All right. So you finally, you want to compare the different features between RDS and EC2. Uh, usually it comes down to um, what can I do first? Uh, do, I, do I do what's called a lift and shift and take my servers exactly like they are and put them into EC2? Um, do I try to migrate straight to RDS? Um, that's not easy, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, do I uh, migrate everything, like I said, to my EC2 and then build new applications in RDS? That's a lot of times what happens. So uh, what ends up happening is usually a combination of the two. So generically speaking, most customers they might try to do a lift and shift. They get over into EC2 and uh, to get it established in place, they do start their performance tuning and changing things to, uh, to make it better. But any brand new projects that come out, they try to weigh, can we get this to, into RDS uh, or, or are we dependent on special features? And then as you have things going and you're doing your new uh, uh, deployments into RDS too, you can go back and visit your EC2 database systems and start figuring out 
uh, some of these databases. Can we start moving these over to RDS as well? Um, because we have them in the cloud. Maybe they don't need some of those limiting, restricting features. And uh, uh, we could start migrating those as well. So that's a lot what most people generically do. That doesn't mean that your business has to be most people in generic, but that's kind of the, the feel and the flow. Let's see here. Okay, this slide shows uh, some of the comparison items you need to consider, but I think the top row is, is really um, the main thing that sums it up to me, in my opinion. So do you need only what is cost effective? Or do you need to have more control over your database? Uh, and that's slightly more important than just the cost. So uh, usually, like I said, the answer is not cut and dry. It's probably just a blend of the two. And uh, like I said, you, you have to consider all the different options and what's available. RDS offers a lot of the same things that EC2 does, but you just need to figure out, do I want more control or do I want only what's cost effective? Okay, so this uh, slide here also shows some of the comparison items that you'll need to consider. Um, let's see, uh, uh, another reason to get some help or uh, assistance also in, in making your decision. Um, I would use professional consulting uh, to first understand what your business uh, has and then to help you guide in what's the best fit for your business because there's not just a simple wizard uh, to choose and you can't just go through and click next, 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 unfortunately, with migrate my database to the cloud and, and have it be done. There's a, a lot of tough decisions that need to be made, trying to figure out what instances you should pick, what uh, hard drives you should pick, and, and do we actually go straight to EC2? Do we try to develop and, and change and go to RDS? There's a lot of choices here and uh, make sure that you make the right choices and uh, I suggest a lot of times getting some help. Okay, here's another thing that you might want to also consider. I know I mentioned quickly um, S3. Um, for all of your servers, your EC2 servers, uh, for your backup space, or if you actually use um, like file servers, don't use your EC2 space for those purposes, make sure you do allocate the, uh, uh, the an S3 storage instead of um, your more expensive EC2 disks. You'll be able to actually save the money associated with the EC2 disks, and you'll have the flexibility, like again, I said, of, of being able to migrate between some of the other environments if you need to, because you can mount those uh, S3 buckets in multiple locations. And then also you can take advantage of your AWS billing portal to track your usage. Where am I spending my money? Uh, you can identify um, any unneeded resources. Maybe your um, servers that you use are, are a little bit more seasonal. Maybe you need to allocate, like I said, other um, systems f seasonally and then uh, uh, take back some of those resources when the season goes down a little bit. You have that flexibility in the cloud uh, to be able to do some of those things. So now that we've actually gone through uh, RDS and we've gone through EC2 and talked about that a little bit, let's take our final poll uh, before I move on to uh, DBAs in the cloud. What does the DBA need to do in the cloud and what, what's going to happen to my job? So uh, this last question, what benefits do you expect from moving to the cloud? Uh, business continuity, IT efficiency, operational or capital expense cost savings, uh, elastic capacity or IT capacity? Do you need more flexibility for your team or is it something else? Because it's cool and I can put it on my business card. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's it. That's exactly it. It has to do with, that has to do with security too, because the more that we've had the cloud out there, the more that we realize, hey, this is really a secure option and then you can brag about it to others. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my stuff is safe in the cloud. Is yours? Exactly. All right, so let me go ahead and share these results out. 62% business con continuity, 56% uh, operational or capital expense cost savings. 72%, well, these numbers don't seem right. Do, do, I feel yeah, like we're a little off. Multiple. They pick multiple. Oh, they, they could pick multiple, okay. 
yes. elastic capacity or IT capacity on demand, which I think is, I, I love this one too. I, it's good to see this high yeah. percentage because I think this is the winner. Right. So uh, I think uh, the elastic capacity and almost the business continuity, uh, that flexibility is now in the same bucket to me because um, being flexible and being able to deploy servers anywhere in the world without having to own um, uh, real estate in that location or without having to find some place and, and rent real estate in that place is kind of amazing. So uh, being able to set up a failover in Asia, that's uh, before you would have to actually find a data center, purchase all the hardware, put it in place. Uh, now with AWS, you can select it. It can be one of your options as one of your failover nodes. Uh, so it, it expands your ability for your business continuity without you having to uh, purchase real estate, make sure the networks are in place and work really, really well because of the a failover to somewhere uh, of that nature is huge. And uh, uh, having being able to put the different server nodes uh, to give you that flexibility all across the world is an awesome thing to be able to do. And to be able to react as your business needs it is a huge benefit because um, with on premises, you have to plan you have to plan in advance. And when you realize there's a problem, you all of a sudden have to budget, expand, purchase, move and grow. Not the same with the cloud. Uh, now you see you have a need, you can click and move right to it and pay for only what you need while you need it. Jeff, just a quick time check. We got about five minutes. Oh, good gosh. I'm going <laughs> to have to talk much faster. Okay, guys, I'll try to skip what I can. Um, if I, if you guys can download the slides and stuff a little bit later, and if there's other details and stuff that you need, because I'm going to have to buzz through a little bit quicker, um, reach out. I'd be happy to help out and, and, and give you guys uh, some more feedback of anything. So, um, okay. One of the DBA things that the DBA really, really needs to do is uh, uh, focus on performance baselining. You're going to have to do this uh, before you migrate, after you migrate, and then as an ongoing thing. So make sure you pick really good metrics, and then you need to keep uh, uh, checking these metrics going forward as well. Um, one of our customers that actually came to us uh, was actually Sony, and they had some uh, some huge needs. They had actually migrated to um, an Azure cloud instance, but it was set up a little bit different than some of the things that we've discussed. It was based on, um, it was a premium model, but it was based on transactions. And this is why it's actually important to do uh, some, um, anyway, we, we were able to migrate them to uh, the cloud. Uh, we were able to help them save money in the long run. Um, we were able to increase the performance with them. And their, the, one of their high needs was high availability that they needed to be more flexible. They had uh, older 2008 R2 servers and only two nodes. Uh, we were able to get them uh, three nodes in EC2. I'll be able to give them high availability and failover and increase their performance, uh, which is huge needs and uh, uh, all without breaking the bank and when they move forward. So now they have their data warehouse in the cloud. Now they're able to be a little bit more flexible. Uh, they can even use some of the data warehouse uh, um, analytics type tools, AWS Glue and Amazon QuickSight. So it's, it's a big benefit they have. Um, next slide, post-migration activities. Your DBAs, like I said, you, you need to actually constantly um, do your baselining. Keep doing that moving forward. Um, one of the things that's very important is your uh, cloud database. You're going to need to tune it a little bit for the cloud. And I can mention this since I won't be able to go over it in detail. Um, back in November at the SQL Pass Summit, one of uh, my coworkers, his name's Rajnakat Tandel, did a presentation at the, at the SQL Summit. And it actually covered the uh, performance tuning your database in the cloud. So there are lots of things that you could learn from that. If you had a team member uh, uh, was able to go to the summit, you could probably still purchase the downloads, those um, 
um, presentations and uh, take a look at that because there's a lot of things that you can do to uh, performance tune and set up databases. There's um, uh, one quick example that, uh, uh, like I said, we did have a customer that had was using that Azure model, and they were it's basically a DTU, which is a database transaction unit, and they weren't happy with their performance, and they were paying eight thousand dollars a month. They asked Databail to take a look at that, and when we did take a look at that, uh, we were able to find there were some very small, minor queries, but they were using implicit conversions. Uh, these queries, though, they ran like a hundred times a minute. So. Uh, we told them they need to actually change these queries to use the proper data types. And within one flash DTU, their usage came down to 10%. So there's minor things, minor changes, but their bill instantly went from 8,000 a month to 1,700 a month. So that's why it's important to become familiar with uh, cloud design, come uh, become familiar with what you need to do to uh, improve your environment after it's in the cloud. So there's different educational things you need to, to help move forward and, and take care of your needs. Um, and your DBAs, I'm going to go through this through 90 miles an hour. Um, there is still a ton of work that they need to be doing uh, for the EC2 instances, as well as even for the RDS instances. The only things they'll be missing out on is uh, if they're RDS, is you won't be installing patches, uh, you won't be doing database backups, um, and you don't have to worry about configuring and maintaining the high availability if it's RDS. Everything else is automatically included. Uh, uh, actually, I mean, it's, it's covered the same in both. Uh, you still have to do your database performance monitoring and tuning. You still have to, uh, to worry about security and capacity planning. I had a whole other uh, uh, section I was gonna talk about dealing with capacity planning. And uh, one quick tip I was gonna say is try to use query store uh, it's available. You can still use that in your RDS and your EC2, but it'll actually help you as your databases grow. Um, we've had problems before. I've seen problems where a database was running perfectly. Nobody's touched it. It didn't have any deployments, but all of a sudden between yesterday and today, now all of a sudden they're saying it's running slow. And of course, your first thought is someone changed the code. That's not always the case. Sometimes once your tables go past a certain threshold that might be an unwritten threshold, uh, your performance can actually completely change because the database engine picked a different plan. But how do I ident identify that? Query store can help you with, with growing databases and large databases because that query that worked fast yesterday that you can't today, you could take a look inside the historical query planes and figure out when did it switch and why is it um, going so much slower right now. So uh, I won't have time to actually go through that in, in great detail, but hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit more benefit out of that. The rest of the slides, um, I'm just gonna buzz through. Um, the whole gist of it is basically to give you some things you can take a look at when comparing the different environments and who's responsible for what. Um, okay, I buzzed through 90 miles an hour the last five minutes. Uh, the, the last point is, uh, as a summary, is basically we discussed um, what's the cloud, uh, this list the cloud itself, cover the cloud providers and who's the leader in the cloud. Uh, we covered and offered, uh, off what does AWS offer for SQL Server in the cloud, EC2 and RDS. We discussed high availability and disaster recovery. And we also discussed the importance of performance baselining both before uh, migration, after, and then ongoing. And that we tried to discuss the DBA's duties, but well, we kind of basically run out of town. So um, what's left is actually your decisions now. Um, if you feel you need some help with these evaluations and decisions, uh, data avails there. We're happy to help you and help guide you through some of those choices. Uh, and I do think, hopefully we have enough time. I, I know our data avail panelists have been feeling questions throughout the presentation and maybe there's something we can share with the whole group uh, now that we're done. So do we have any questions that we actually had found that we should actually share with uh, everybody that joined? Sure, absolutely. Um, so first question was, um, if you're specialized in SQL Server, why would you choose AWS instead of Azure? Um, since Azure SQL database is native and includes all the new features in there, what what would be some of those decision points? Okay, so AWS, they uh, 
uh, it's a very good question. And if uh, I would actually look at each option uh, for my current system, do I think Azure is a better fit or do I fit AWS is a better fit? AWS, like I said, they do have a more, uh, a larger infrastructure. They have more failover. They have very high connectivity between the different availability zones. So your uh, failover is usually more fluid and uh, communication between the different environments is more stable. AWS does have a, a lot more tools to offer right now too. And they've been the leader, like I said, for the last, you know, 14 years. So uh, Azure is improving. Azure is growing. They've doubled in the last four years. So they're definitely on the right path. But right now, um, AWS has twice as much and twice as much to offer more downtime, more stability and security. But um, Azure has nothing to sneeze at. It's definitely still a viable and good option. Okay, fantastic. Um, what do you use for monitoring SQL Server on EC2 SQL? Um, that was one of the slides I went through at 90 miles an hour. Um, <laughs> EC, EC2, you can use any monitoring that you use in-house. So it's just, you have your Windows systems, uh, anything that you can install on it, you can you can use for monitoring. It's of course completely different for the RDS. You have to use some of the other built-in tools that they have for monitoring, but EC2, basically you're not limited. If you wanna use, uh, let's just arbitrarily say Spotlight because it's one of the ones that's out there, you can use it. So um, uh, we at Dataveil, we have our, Delta tool, and we use our Delta tools on our EC2 instances um, if the customers, you know, agree with that too. So just about anything that you would use on your on-premises, you can use on EC2. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to ask a question of my own because I am curious. For the uptimes between the cloud providers, how often do those get published? Um, I couldn't find a recent one for 2019. I think it's okay. annually because the reports that I did find were annually based. So I found one for all of 2018, but over the last uh, few weeks when I was uh, putting together the statistics for this, I couldn't find one yet for 2019. Each of the individual cloud providers provide their own metrics. Yeah. So it's not something that's, uh, AWS gathered it for everyone else. <laughs> so each provider provided their own metrics uh, to um, a, a third party facility and they were able to, uh, to produce that for everyone. Sure, sure, kind of like the politic polling. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, um, let's go ahead and go to the last slide and we'll wrap it up. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, it was absolute pleasure to have Data Vale with us today and Jeff, thank you so much. Um, Really appreciate you all sharing your knowledge with, with the PASS org, um, really important for us. Um, so at the end here, what do, so thank you for attending. Reach out to Jeff and the, the group at DataVail. If you have any further questions, uh, please remember that you guys can uh, download those handouts in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, and Jeff, for the link on the, the to win the sony headphones did we have something out there um yes i believe they they produced the link uh looks like i can see a oh, link right it, there it is in the just chat now. window yep yeah it and is in the chat to window to so so everybody can hit that link and go uh try to win some of those headsets a headset that would be fantastic okay thank you all very much have a great rest of your day and thank you again data veil for your time Thank you.